Good afternoon, everyone. It's Thursday, the 27th of September, and this is the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. It's a great pleasure uh, to be with you this afternoon, and I hope that you guys have all had a great week since we had the chance to speak last Friday. That was the uh, special live Q&A before the final episode of Ancient Invisible Cities Istanbul. I hope you're able to tune in to see the programme, or if not, you can still catch it on BBC iPlayer over the next six months. The BBC are going to put it on not just for the normal month, but for six months to make sure everyone gets a good chance to enjoy the kind of beautiful vistas of Istanbul, Cairo and Athens that we had both above ground and below ground. Uh, thank you for all your wonderful feedback on the programme. It's been really, really great to, to hear and see. And it's really important to get that feedback because it helps us improve uh, in what we hope will be a follow up series. Um, but also it's incredibly useful for me when I put my university hat on uh, the University of Warwick uh, because of the, the research excellence framework exercise that we're engaged in through to 2021 and particularly thinking about the impact that we have to show we have outside of the academic world in the wider world. Hello, Susie, how are you doing? Great that you could join us. Um, and all your feedback is incredibly useful to show the kinds of impacts that these programmes are having. So please do keep your feedback coming in either through the Facebook page or through my website. Hi, Linda, how are you doing? Hi, Shan, how are you doing? Great to see you. Thank you guys for joining. Um, you can leave feedback through my website, w.michaelscottweb.com. And then there's a feedback page with a two, three minute questionnaire. It's really hugely appreciated that you take the time to do that. Um, so today we have uh, some new questions that have come in um, and I'm really glad to be able to answer some of them as we go. The first is from Angela Ryder. Uh, so there are many texts from ancient Greece and Rome that we know were written but either do not exist for us to read or are fragmentary today. If you could choose one to be discovered in its entirety what would it be? Great question. Thank you, Angela. Yes, absolutely. We know that there was huge amounts written in Greek and Roman antiquity and just a small percentage of it has survived through to us today, either through uh, papyri being discovered, ancient papyri being discovered, normally in Egypt, where it's the dry desert sand that preserves the papyri uh, over such long periods of time. And one of the most famous places that uh, such finds have been have come out of is a place called Oxyrhynchus, the ancient city of Oxyrhynchus in Egypt, where a rubbish dump was discovered, an ancient rubbish dump where they were just tipping stuff out. And these fragments of papyri using all sorts of incredible modern technologies have been able to read uh, the uh, the words that are written on these papyri. And, and as a result, amazing texts have been discovered. Or our texts come to us through them being copied out generation after generation, often within the church and by monks. Um, and uh, thus exists for us as a sort of hand-me-down. Hi, Philip, how are you doing? Thank you very much. But there's lots we know has not survived, but we hear about it in other sources that do survive. So we have this sense, um, this tantalising sense of the things that we are missing. And, and for me, I mean, one of the things that I would love to get my hands on uh, is uh, more works of Aristotle, or at least from the school of Aristotle, possibly also written by his students. Um, we know he not only wrote his, his major works about politics and society and constitutions and the, and the workings of, of the polis, the city-state in ancient Greece, the politic, but he also wrote constitution studies of the constitutions of individual city states, and there were apparently about 170 of these. Um, one of the most famous surviving found in the Oxyrhynchus rubbish dump in Egypt was the constitution of the Athenians, the constitution of Athens. Um, but we know that he wrote many, many more really in depth kind of case studies, if you like, of how different city states around the ancient Greek Mediterranean world did their politics, and we know that it that varied hugely. So, I would like if I can choose more than one text, Angela. Sorry, this is a kind of a bit of a cheat, isn't it? Hi, Asia, how are you doing? Great that you've been able to join us. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would like uh, every one of the 170 Aristotelian uh, constitutional case studies that have been written, because I think that would give us an amazing insight into the sheer diversity of the ancient Greek world, which is something I think that we really still struggle to get our hair around. Uh, hi, Frank, how are you doing? From Cottbus, excellent, with the pyramids uh, kind of in the gardens. Thank you so much for joining joining us, Frank. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, yes, I would like those case studies because I think it really would help us understand the, the, the variety and flexibility of Greek culture and give us a little bit of a sense of what it would have been like for an ancient Greek traveling from place to place, actually having to turn up in, in somewhere new and think, all right, how do they do things here? Oh, this is a bit different from home. That sense that actually they were making a journey, not just within their world or indeed within their, their kind of landscape, but actually a journey from 
one kind of place to another. Um, hi, Stefania, how are you doing? Ciao, Mike. Ciao, ciao, ciao. Come over. Nice to see you. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in. So thank you, Andrew. That's a really great question. And it's one I'd like to turn back to you guys as well who are watching. Uh, do send in now. If you have a favourite text that you know existed in antiquity but has not survived through to us today but you would like to get your hands on, let me know now if you can over the live Q&A what that is uh, or let me know through it via the Facebook page afterwards. We'll put up a post and try and uh, collate the best. Um, but uh, that kind of that would be my tech. The entire constitutional um, case studies uh, of, the, of Aristotle and of his students. A great question. So we go on to one more question. This is the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott. Thank you so much for joining us the Thursday, 27th of September. We do this every Thursday afternoon, four o'clock uh, for half an hour, 4 p.m. UK time. Uh, and it's a great chance for me to be able to uh, talk with you all and answer some of your questions that you've submitted through the Facebook page in advance. Um, and uh, <laughs> Angela, great there. Let's get a whole library. Absolutely. Did you know, I found this fact out the other day, which I think is absolutely brilliant, that the uh, Amazon an Alexa, the, the kind of thing that now that everyone's, I'm still slightly nervous about having one in the house, I don't really want something listening to me all the time, but uh, the Amazon Alexa is called Alexa after the Library of Alexandria, that great mm, sort of centre of knowledge and learning from antiquity, Alexandria in Egypt. Um, Amazon decided to call their, their device Alexa to mimic that sense that it's going to be uh, the kind of the centre of all knowledge um, uh, or at least the, the access point to all knowledge uh, going forward. So hi, uh, Redruba. Uh, Thank you so much for tuning in from India and Alexandra. You'd like the lost Theban plays? Great. Yeah, absolutely. Kind of a bit more a bit more drama on the stage would be no bad thing. I mean, I think particularly in terms of ancient Greek drama, we have a, go a good-ish number of 5th century plays, but it would be great to get some of the 4th century um, plays as well in their entirety uh, because the drama continued kind of being a very uh, kind of uh, important part of Athens during the 4th century BC but we have so much so little of it surviving because but even by that stage the canon of the great works of Aeschylus, Euripides and Sophocles had started to form um, kind of like hi Sheila how are you doing so glad you could join us Stefano you were fascinated by the documentary on Naples absolutely and we have some exciting discoveries um, coming up uh, re Naples so in this live Q&A we take some of your questions well I hope to answer some of them Sort of spark some debate and, and, and discussion as well but then we also do a, a kind of classics or ancient world in the news section and there's something coming up uh, that's just been discovered very near uh, Naples in Kumai that I want to tell you about and then we also do a kind of what's on section so kind of exhibitions and other lectures and events that you might like to attend to if you can um, so keep listening in we've got uh, some more questions to go though uh, for another one here from Zia Pepe have you ever been denied access to something you would have liked to film in the Ancient Invisible uh, Cities series? This is a really interesting question because I am amazed constantly uh, when I talk with both academics and with the public um, how sometimes unaware people are, hi Debbie, how you doing, of the, of the sheer practicalities that go into making a programme. Um, and, and I was amazed by this first several years ago when actually uh, uh, an academic project began that was studying TV documentaries about the ancient world and looking at how these TV doc documentaries had been made um, and analysing them as if they were almost ancient academic or ancient texts. Um, and they and they did this project and, and, and it did not really kind of factor into the thinking to begin with that you perhaps didn't get access to something you wanted. They have presumed that uh, everything was possible, every site was visitable, every object was available, every person you wanted to talk to was available, uh, and you had your, your kind of perfect choice. So everything that ended up on the screen was, was an active choice. Um, and that's simply just not how it happens. So if you think about it, we film in a very specific, very concentrated segment, about 10 days of filming for a one hour programme. So if people aren't available during that 10 days or a site is under restoration or it's closed for repair or an object has gone on loan, we can't get to it. And so uh, when we create the scripts and the stories, it's it's both thinking about what we want to say, what, what I want to kind of the, 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 the script to be about and the ideas and the things I want to show you and the places we want to go. But it's also then about the practicalities of can we do that? How do we do that? Can we do that within the timetable um, that we've got? Uh, and then we have to adjust uh, and play with the script um, uh, as it goes forward. So, so yes, and, and we have been denied access to things. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, in Istanbul, uh, the programme we recently did, 
engage in invisible cities in Istanbul. Some of you may have noticed that we went into some underground systems. We went into the ones uh, underneath the Hippodrome, which in some ways are absolutely fantastic because they're close to the public. You can't get in there um, without special access and special permission. But we also did want to go into the famous uh, Basilica systems, Justinian systems, that you can visit as a tourist to Istanbul. They're a huge underground network of, of columns, that's kind of almost forest of columns holding up the roof of the gigantic system. Um, and it was filmed in recently for the big, uh, the, the um, with Tom Hanks, for the sequence, uh, one of the sequels of the Da Vinci Code uh, books uh, was in there filming with the Medusa head, one of the columns that sort of turned on its head underwater uh, with the Medusa head. Um, and uh, it's also been used, I think, I think going back as far as some of the James Bond films, I think as well, uh, filmed in there. But we couldn't get access. Uh, we uh, There were issues um, in Istanbul in the weeks running up to filming, including senior public officials being removed from office. And as a result, people were quite nervous and did not want to uh, sign off on permissions. Um, and as a result, we simply couldn't get in there to film. Uh, so we had to kind of uh, lose that one, lose that location and, and tell our story in a slightly different way. So these things do happen. They happen all the time. Uh, so when you're watching any programme, you should be thinking as much about what they're not showing you um, as what they are showing you. Um, and often there is a story behind that. So thank you, uh, Zia, for that question. That was absolutely great. We'll do one more question before we go into uh, the In the News. Um, Nikki Ketley has asked, which is best to visit, Pompeii or Herculaneum or both? Inferno, Linda. That's it. Thank you very much. Yep, the Inferno. Uh, Dan Brown. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Set in Florence. And then they kind of end up uh, heading off to save the world from a mass uh, viral uh, infection that's going to be launched from Istanbul in the Basilica Systems. That's the one. Um, so Tom Hanks could get in there, but uh, but we couldn't. But uh, I mean, sometimes permissions, filming permissions are incredibly difficult to get. So m some of you may know that the, the sequel to Mamma Mia, uh, Mamma Mia 2, which you know obviously should be set in Greece, given the storyline and given where they filmed Mamma Mia 1, uh, but actually they, they couldn't get permission to film it in Greece. And so I think it was actually filmed uh, off the coast of Croatia. Um, so sometimes these things happen, even for massive Hollywood budget movies, as much as for small... Uh, BBC TV documentaries. Hi, Christina. Hello. How are you doing? Um, thank you very much indeed for joining this live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott, where we're talking a little bit about questions that you've sent in. Um, and thank you for some of your responses already to the uh, issue of what ancient text would you like to have in your hands that hasn't survived for us? Um, please do keep those answers coming in. That's absolutely great. Um, anyway, which is best to visit? This is a question from Nikki Ketley. Which is best to visit Pompeii or Herculaneum? Well, or both, as you say at the end of your question. Well, hi, well, hi, Marion, how are you doing? Great that you could join us. Um, I mean, both, obviously, if you've got the time uh, to do so. Uh, which is your favourite? Let me know kind of now over the live Q&A. Is it Herculaneum or is it Pompeii? Uh, my personal favourite is always Herculaneum, uh, mostly because it was the first one that I visited when I first went to this part of the country uh, when I was, God, I was uh, 17 at the time. Uh, and I remember spending the day in Herculaneum and when you, uh, I love the fact that you sort of descended down into it uh, along that ramp that takes you down deep, deep, deep down. And of course, Herculaneum was much more deeply buried by the mudslides of Vesuvius than the, the ash covering of Pompeii, which was further afield. Hi, Marjorie. Thank you. I'm so glad you like the TV. Hello, and Stephanie. Herculano coming from Stephanie. Herculano. Okay, is your favourite too. Great. I'm so glad we've got a fellow Herculaneum uh, supporter. Um, but that sense that, that when you come down this ramp where they've had to excavate metres and metres and metres of mud to get down to the level of the ancient city. And then where you come in is effectively the old, the ancient sea line where the port was. And that absolutely chilling sight, which I remember seeing when I was 17. And every time I go back since, and we filmed it again for, for ancient invisible cities, uh, for, for invisible, Italy's invisible cities, uh, Naples program several years back, uh, where you have the skeletons um, all gathered together in the boat sheds on the seashore of the people who were desperate to escape from the city as Vesuvius as the mudslide from Vesuvius and the volcano eruption was taking place. And when you look at some of those skeletons uh, and you look at the analysis of what's happened to the bodies in those final moments, um, you know, the, the heat, the sheer heat was, was literally blowing brains and skulls apart. Um, kind of, uh, so, uh, I mean, that is an image which has stayed with me um, ever since and, and, and talk about being transferred 
back through time to to such a, a terrifying experience uh, as the final moments of these people all huddled together desperately trying to escape um, Vesuvius. Uh, Indi Indica, the original work, absolutely. Thank you as a great text to, uh, we would love to have in our hands, um, kind of Arian's Indica or Megasthenes' Indica as well. Like kind of, uh, be great to have some of those. Thank you, Dredrupa, uh, for that. Yes, absolutely. Some of the texts that talk about how the Greeks understood, engaged with, visited, uh, and, and sort of saw the bigger ancient world, the kind of communities that they started to engage with in, in Asia, India, um, kind of absolutely more of those texts because we know they survived. Um, they know well, we know they were written and they survived for some time, but but sadly not to us today. Alexandra, you'd love to see the Herculaneum Theatre. Well, I have a feeling the theatre at Herculaneum is now going to be open to the public uh, for special tours. So I would double check that and get on the Herculaneum website because I think in the last year or two they've they've decided to be able to make it available. We were lucky enough to get in there for Italy's Invisible Cities. Uh, Naples um, and and what an extraordinary extraordinary uh, underground or well, now underground theatre it is but definitely have another look because I think uh, you might well be able to get in there so Herculaneum is my favourite um, but I, I will accept people who say Pompeii uh, that's all right um, and of course both would be best so Nikki thank you very much indeed uh, for that question uh, so let's move to the in the news section. Uh, some of the things that have been happening again. There's been some great discoveries, and we're posting some of these on the Facebook page as well as on my Twitter uh, line, which is at Prof MC Scott. Um, good afternoon, Julia. How are you doing? Uh, what do I think about ruins? Should we reconstruct or leave as it is? Great. Thank you. That's another great question. I think it uh, it so often depends on the site, the location, what people were aiming to do with the site. Is it you know, we're trying to make it available to tourists? Are we trying to help the public understand the location more? Are we going to damage the building in any way um, and there's lots of then different strategies of reconstruction so sometimes people want to use a material which is very very different from the ancient material so it's very clear what's old and what's new sometimes people want a material which at least from a distance uh, looks like it sort of matches in a lot more even if close up you can tell um, and there's been a sort of move against restoration because of the sort of plethora of restoration that was done in the 19th and tw early 20th centuries um, which often used sort of iron rivets and other such things to put pieces back together, which of course then corroded and expanded and ended up doing more damage um, to the ancient material. So we're in a phase right now where people are a bit more reluctant, I think, to do that kind of reconstruction. And one of the most exciting things, and you'll have seen this in the Ancient Invisible Cities series, where what we can do with 3D laser scanning, with virtual reality, or with then kind of reconstruction of ancient buildings kind of in the virtual world, that we could do a lot more of that now. And that technology is really coming online, which I think is going to be incredibly exciting. Uh, we've, we've, we've brought into a kind of whole set of virtual reality Oculus Go sets in Warwick, and we now use these with our student outreach days. Uh, and we use the ancient virtual reality Athens that's been created that you can sort of wander around different parts of ancient Athens in virtual reality. And I have to admit that I got completely lost um, because suddenly walls are everywhere. You're used to ruins being at sort of knee height, absolutely uh, maximum, but uh, uh, suddenly there are walls everywhere and you have to sort of rethink your way around a site that you know very well from a from a top-down bird's eye plan. So so I would I suggest lots more of that kind of stuff. It would, would make lots of sites much more quickly, much more easily available to people um, across the world. Uh, the new excavations, Richard, at Pompeii do look amazing. You're absolutely right. And the finds that come out of Pompeii on an annual basis are extraordinary. Both sites are absolutely extraordinary. Um, I think I just have a, a sort of small personal passion for Herculaneum. Stephanie, that'd be good. You'll be in Naples in October. Good. Get in there and, and see if you can get in the theatre. I hope you very much can. What else has been happening in the news? Well, there's been some massive ancient building discovered by archaeologists in Egypt at Mit Rahina, which is just south of Cairo. Um, they've come across not just a, a, an enormous building, which they're still trying to work out what the use is for, but an Another, but it's attached to a large Roman baths and there's another kind of chamber which seems to be religious. This would be very interesting if it if it is offering something which is the Roman era occupation of the area of Cairo because one of the things that's actually missing quite a lot from, from, from Cairo and the physical landscape uh, around Cairo is, is that of the Roman era occupation. You might have remembered in Ancient Invisible Cities Cairo we went to part of the ancient uh, uh, sort of Roman fortress that was built to guard the entry point, the connection between the Nile and the man-made canal they dug all the way to the Red Sea, which is now underneath a, a Greek Orthodox church. Uh, but it would be great to have some more Roman area pieces 
Um, so hopefully that might more we might hear more about that in the future. Thanks, Julia. Oh, I'm so glad. To, uh, good, good. Thank you so much for joining us and for your question. Um, also, I wanted to Vindolanda, another place very close to my heart. Um, as we filmed there back in in 2014 when we were doing uh, Roman Britain from the air uh, of ITV, when Christine Bleakley and I were kind of exploring around the fantastic remains of Roman Britain, both from helicopters. Well, Christine was in a helicopter more often than I was down on the ground, and it actually had a chance to excavate uh, uh, at Vindolanda a little bit. Hi, Jan. How are you? doing thank you very much for joining this live q a with me professor michael scott on thursday the 27th of september thank you very much for your questions do keep coming in keep them coming in live now over the live feed or else uh, via the facebook page and any we don't get around to today we will uh, put on the list to answer in future weeks um the vindalanda 2019 young person bursary has just been announced and this is a fantastic opportunity for students between 16 and 18 or those in full-time education up to the age of 25 so thinking about all you university students who might be listening right now or watch later this is a chance for you to join the Vindolanda excavations um, and you get not just a place on the excavation but you get full board accommodation uh, during your time with them and so this is an incredible opportunity to get some amazing experience hi Tracy how are you doing great that you can watch live we're so glad that you could join us um, but so definitely uh, the link uh, for where to apply it's findalanda.com the website and then to excavate uh, forward slash excavate forward slash 2019 bursary but we'll make sure that the link is on the facebook page as well so please 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 do have a think about that it's a great a great chance and, and also i remember uh, i said earlier that there's been a discovery near naples recently and this is kumai um so the the greek settlement that was begun in the 8th century bc a greek uh, kind of colony or group of Greeks moving out of central Greece and moving to uh, kind of the southern, well, to Sicily and to southern Italy. Uh, Kumai was one of their great uh, foundations. Uh, from a second, from the second century BC, so long, about 600 years after the foundation of Kumai, they've recently discovered a new tomb, fantastically, beautifully painted uh, the interior of this tomb with ornate banquet scenes. And this is absolutely fantastic that this material is coming to light and is so, in such an incredible state of preservation. So being studied as we speak and hopefully uh, will be available to us to, to understand a little bit more about. But of course, uh, Kumai is, is, is very near the Campo Flagre, the burning fields um, that we visited uh, when we did Italy's Invisible Cities, Naples, and very close to uh, Bayo, the kind of seaside resort of the ancient Romans, uh, where we went diving underwater to find those Roman villas, the, the beautiful mosaic floors of the Roman villas still surviving at the bottom of the of the first underwater archaeological park in Italy, where you can actually go, if you, if you can scuba dive, you can turn up at this site there's a scuba diving team there and, and you can don your scuba gear and go down to see some of these underwater archaeological remains absolutely um, a fantastic experience or if you can't scuba dive you can snorkel and see some stuff and they'll also take you out on some boats as well um, to catch uh, some of the sites underwater uh, last thing that I wanted to tell you about what well, we've got to do what's on what's on um, uh, so the uh, we have I, it's, it, it's a it's a it's, it's quite a personal focused what's on today i prepare you for that uh first off i have to remind you about the lytham st anne's classical association branch now i'm president of this branch and have been for since its inauguration uh five years ago it's now in its fifth year um it has been since since the end of its first year the largest branch of the classical association anywhere in the country uh, and they run a fantastic program of lectures which will include me i'm going up there in january to give my annual presidential lecture uh you can join the society if you live anywhere near Near Lytham St Anne's um, but you can also follow what they're doing through their website and through their Facebook page uh, and they've got a fantastic array of speakers coming up so they just had Adam Hart Davies last week uh, Peter Stewart Armand Dangor who does a lot about ancient Greek music Manda Scott and Tom Holland will be visiting alongside me during the course of the year so Lytham St Anne's Classical Association uh, I'll be there they're a great great bunch of people absolutely wonderful team um, and bringing in fantastic audiences of 300 plus turned up to see Adam Hart Davies recently uh, just the the week um, absolutely fantastic classics thriving um, in the northwest it's great to see um, uh, also at Warwick so in the Midlands at my university two things to announce to you first off there's a, a great uh, kind of a day being uh, run on 6th of March next year but applications for spaces are open and, and spaces are running out quickly so do get in on this if you can um, it's particularly aimed for and is free for students in secondary schools um, at years 9 to 11 so if you've got any uh, sons daughters 
services you think might work for that and, and you think you, your school might be able to get them uh, to Warwick, then then absolutely get in touch and see if you can persuade or pester your school to book some places. Um, and it's Ancient Images Modernised, it's called The Classical World in Modern Media and Advertising. And it's thinking about how examples from the ancient world are so often brought into both consciously and sometimes subconsciously modern advertising and media. And the day will be talking about how the ancient world is used, how it's been changed, how it's been manipulated, played with, re-represented and re-represented again, but also allow the students to kind of devise their own modern advertising campaign uh, using some kind of ancient material or ancient idea. So it's a great chance to get involved with the university. It's organised under the auspices of the Warwick Classics Network, which is our, our outreach engine that I direct. Um, and uh, it's a great chance to, to, to just have some fun as well. So I hope you can uh, get involved with that. Uh, Linda, do you have a question from Linda? Do you have a favourite ancient civilization? Um, well, I love the more, and the great thing is there's more and more to discover as well. I mean, the direction of my research in recent years uh, turning towards global history. Uh, so I'm thinking about the connections between the Mediterranean, the cultures of the Mediterranean with Asia, India and China. Just keeps exploding my mind as to how many wonderful different ancient civilizations there are to engage with and how much they were engaged with one another. Um, but I guess there will always be a favour, which is where I started with, which is with the Greeks. Um, so that's that's my uh, kind of a, sh a short answer to that. Uh, another thing to announce from Warwick as part of our outreach event, particularly aimed at school kids, is our annual drama festival. So this is where our students, our undergraduates, put on an ancient play. It's going to be Aristophanes' Frogs this year in 2019. The day is in January 2019, January 25th. Um, and any school students can uh, and schools can apply to come. It's a free, again an event that put on free of charge. We take over the main theatre of Warwick Arts Centre, the professional arts uh, arts uh, auditorium at the centre of the University of Warwick, and we have uh, over 560 school children coming along with their teachers to enjoy not just the play, but then a series of lectures, which will also include one by me uh, about the play and about the society that created and about issues that are raised in the play. Um, so that runs for an entire day, and again. Uh, if your kids are kind of anywhere, well, we, kids come from probably age of 12 upwards, uh, right through to GCSE and A-level. So if you're in that ballpark, uh, I pester your school again to get in touch. Um, have a look, just Google Warwick Classics Drama Festival and you'll find us on the website. And I very much hope that you can come and join us for the day. I look forward to seeing you there. Absolutely no previous uh, experience of the ancient world necessary. Hi Sam, hi Davide, thank you very much indeed for joining in this live Q&A uh, with me Professor Michael Scott. Um, looking forward, uh, get your diaries out now for two events not related to Warwick. Uh, the first is an exhibition that's going uh, in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, if you're going to be in Athens, which is going to be about Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian and his relationship and love affair with Athens in Ancient Invisible Cities Athens. We went down into that tight underground aqueduct 60 meters down under the ground and that was a hadrianic creation uh hadrian absolutely lavished the city with a number of important buildings uh, as well as as well as systems to to keep the city functioning in good order in the second century ad um and that exhibition is on is on now but running through until november so you could have got a little bit of time to get to that and then diaries out for even further afield to 2021 the Louvre in Paris will be putting on a fantastic exhibition called Civilization and Culture on the Early Silk Road. So they're currently gathering and deciding what material should be in that exhibition. But that is going to be absolutely stonking. So book your trips to Paris uh, for 2021 to the Louvre. I don't know the exact dates yet of the exhibition. I'm not sure if they've been announced. Check the Louvre website. Um, but it's definitely worth uh, making sure you get to see it. Hannah, thank you so much for such a for making such a kind comment. Um, I absolutely love my subject. I love studying the ancient world and it's uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to share kind of my love of it with you guys so thank you so much for tuning in on a Thursday afternoon we've got what time for I think one more question uh, we've got a question from Becky uh, who is that's on behalf of her daughter Olivia who's aged 11 thank you so much for sending in your questions uh, which is what is your favorite ancient landmark Hi Ken, how are you doing? Thank you very much, so glad you like the programmes. What is your favourite ancient landmark? Um, well, this is a really odd, I have a really odd answer to this one. Uh, and it's, 
if you are traveling through, uh, you leave Greece, you leave Athens, pardon, and you're driving north, you're driving in the direction of Delphi, Thebes, that kind of direction. Um, on a little side road, you will come across something, uh, the modern town of Chironea, which is a tiny, tiny town. But back in 338 BC, this was the site of a great battle, uh, the Battle of Chironea, which was one of the really crucial deciding moments when Philip of Macedon exerted his hegemony over his leadership over the rest of Greece, Philip, of course, being the father of Alexander the Great. Um, and he left a calling card at the battle site that is still there today. He put up a great stone lion, the Lion of Chironea, and it sits over the burial of 300 Theban warriors, we think, um, the, the so-called Theban sacred band, a kind of a, a crack troops of Thebans that the Macedonians faced up against on the battlefield of the Battle of Chironea. Um, and their skeletons have been kind of exhumed and examined and, and, and the ferocity with which they died has been made clear. People have got kind of you know, heads chopped in half and uh, other sorts of uh, incredible injuries. Um, so when you drive on the roadside, you almost miss it. You can miss it in a blink, but this line is still staring out over the battlefield uh, where Philip won in 338 BC. His calling card still there. It hasn't stayed uh, up all the time. It's actually been re-erected more recently uh, in, in, in the modern era. But, but that is my curious but, but, but favourite landmark, uh, who I always try to drive past if I possibly can, stop off and say hello to um, when I'm heading out through Greece. Uh, our, our time is up. I'm so sorry. It's 4.30 uh, already. Uh, I, uh, for, we have got tons more questions to answer, but we will definitely keep them on the list for future. Thank you so much indeed for joining us. Um, this is the live Q&A with me, Professor Michael Scott, Thursday the 27th of September. We are back next Thursday on the 4th of October at four o'clock UK time. I really hope you can uh, join us then. In the meantime, don't forget Ancient Invisible Cities is available on BBC iPlayer. You can leave your feedback either through the Facebook page or through my website, www.michaelscottweb.com. Uh, and on the website, you can see my blog as well. I've got lots of blog posts and you can see lots of the other things uh, I'm getting up to, plus all my uh, public lectures that I'll be doing in different places around the country and internationally uh, will be up there. There's uh, talks coming up in New York uh, and uh, also in Karachi in Pakistan coming up over the next uh, couple of months. So uh, if you're anywhere near those areas, um, I hope you can come along and join. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much uh, for tuning in and have a great rest of the week and weekend. Ciao.